This movie covers subtopic 8.4, Human Systems and Resource Use, under the main topic of IBESS Topic 8, Human Systems and Resource Use. The significant idea number one for this subtopic is that human hearing, caring capacity is difficult to quantify. You need to be able to evaluate the application of caring capacity to local and global human populations. Recall that the definition of caring capacity is the maximum number of a species or load that can be sustainably supported by a given area. At the carrying capacity, K, the population stops growing as resources are maxed out, as illustrated in this graph, where N is the population of a certain species. It is possible to estimate the carrying capacity of an environment for a given species. However, this is problematic in the, cases, in the case of human populations for a number of reasons. One reason it's difficult to measure human carrying capacity is that humans use a great range of resources, much more than just we eat what we eat and drink. Look at this map. It shows which exports make the most money for individual countries. Look at the range of resources in addition to food and drink, like capital goods in the USA, which includes air, aircrafts and transistors. In Canada, Europe and South America. We've got motor vehicle parts and transport equipment. Just think of all the resources required to produce that stuff. Then there are textiles, metals, gems, coal, coal and oil. This is a complicated mix of resources. Again, much more complicated than the resources a deer or bird might need. Another reason it's difficult to measure human carrying capacity is that humans substitute resources with others if the resources run out. For example, they substitute wood for coal, or solar energy for oil, or apricots for peaches. In substituting, they can extend their carrying capacity, at least locally. Another reason it's difficult to measure human carrying capacity is that resource use varies from individual to individual and country to country. For example, look at this map of per capita meat consumption in countries worldwide. Clearly, the United States consumes more meat than India. Another reason human carrying capacity is difficult to quantify is that we import resources from outside our immediate or local environment. So we cannot just look at the local environment to see how many people it can support. It might increase the carrying capacity at a local level, but it will not influence global carrying capacity, or it might decrease it. If the United States imports 10 to 30 percent of food that allows more people to live in this area, however, that food comes from somewhere else in the world thus affecting the global carrying capacity. Developments in technology lead to changes in the resources we use. For example, the use of solar panels can reduce the consumption of fossil fuels, reducing the pace of climate change, thus increasing human carrying capacity. Right? Again, that, inf that makes it difficult to quantify human carrying capacity. What are the different approaches to increasing human carrying capacity. Ecocentrics may try to reduce their use of non-renewable resources and minimize their use of renewable ones. Some may try to drop off the grid, meaning they become self-sufficient through the use of solar energy for electricity, collecting rainwater, growing their own food, etc. While technocentrists may argue there is no limit to the human carrying capacity because technology will have the solutions for human impact. For example, more fuel efficient vehicles will stretch out the time before oil is fully depleted. Genetically modified crops can increase food yield, allowing us to feed more people. This figure shows a general diagram of a linear example, a human impact which increases linear with the population, such as transport emissions, where some change, for example, a drop in the average distance traveled in private motor vehicles, which results in a shift of the curve, 
and an increase in the number of people that the area can accommodate before the limit is reached. The carrying capacity will have increased. We don't know whether the, such changes might occur in the future. Therefore, it's difficult to quantify human carrying capacity. Similarly, this figure shows a sigmoidal example, which, such, which could be soil erosion, where some change, for example, widespread improvement in soil conservation measures, results in a shift of the entire curve and an increase in the number of people the area can accommodate before the limit is reached. Another example of, the, um, of behavior influencing carrying capacity is visualized with this figure. And it could be stormwater causing a discharge of untreated sewage, where the shift in the curve might be a re result from an increased uptake and insulation of domestic air tanks. Again, shifting the curve and allowing more people to support it by the area. Recall the Malthusian theory proposed in 1798 that set the idea forth that the population can never increase beyond the food supplies necessary to support it. When the population reaches this critical point, there will be war, famine, and disease. In 1976, Paul Ehrlich also proposed that when the population reaches 3.5 million, there will be famines and destruction, and that feeding a population of 6 billion would be totally impossible. So far, both of these predictions of disaster have been incorrect. So what does that mean for the future? Significant idea number two, the ecological footprint is a model that makes it possible to determine whether human populations are living within carrying capacity. An ecological footprint is the area of land and water required to support a defined human population at a given standard of living. The measure takes into account the area required to provide all the resources needed by the population and the assimilation of all wastes. An ecological footprint is a model used to estimate the demands that human populations place on the environment. An ecological footprint is the area of land and water required to support a defined human population at a given standard of living. The measure takes into account the area required to provide all the resources needed by the population and the assimilation of all wastes. You need to be able to compare and contrast the differences in the ecological footprints of two countries and evaluate how environmental value systems impact the ecological footprints of individuals or populations. Ecological footprints may vary significantly from country to country and person to person and includes aspects such as lifestyle choices or environmental value systems, productivity of food production systems, land use and industry. If the ecological footprint of a human population is greater than the land area available to it, this indicates that the population is unsustainable and exceeds the carrying, carrying capacity of that area. Here you see a map illustrating the fact that in ecological footprints vary from country to country. High on the list, United States, low, Sub-Saharan Africa. Let's compare two Western world countries to see what might influence the differences in ecological footprint. The Netherlands, with an ecological footprint of 5.28 um, global hectares per capita, with the United States with an ecological footprint of 12.22 global hectares per capita. What might influence these differences? One could be the different lifestyle choices and the environmental value systems regarding certain practices, such as transportation. In the Netherlands, with the rise in car numbers, there came a huge rise in the number of deaths on the roads. In 1971, more than 3,000 people were killed by motor vehicles, 450 of them children. In response, a social movement demanding safer cycling conditions for children was formed. It was called Stop de Kindermort, Stop the Child Murder. Furthermore, the Dutch faith in the reliability and sustainability of the motor vehicle was also shaken by the Middle East oil crisis of 1973, 
when oil-producing countries stopped exports to the U.S. and Western Europe. These two pressures helped to persuade the Dutch government to invest in improved cycling infrastructure, and Dutch urban planners started to diverge from the car-centric road-building policies being pursued throughout the urbanized West. Biking is very much a part of Dutch culture and mindset, and is often the preferred mode of transportation and commuting. In the U.S., however, it is very difficult to get around in most towns and cities without a car. The Netherlands' bike-centered environmental value system versus the U.S. car-centered environmental value system might contribute to the differences in ecological footprint. The Netherlands is a small, densely populated country, and it does not have the resources thought to be necessary for large-scale agriculture. Yet, it's the globe, global, it's the globe's number two exporter of food as measured by value, second only to the United States. And the United States has 270 times its land mass. The Dutch use climate-controlled indoor farms that require less land mass and less chemicals than traditional outdoor farming. The country is a global leader in the exports of tomatoes, potatoes, and onions, and the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of vegetables, vegetables overall in terms of value. More than a third of all global trade in vegetable seeds originates in the Netherlands. Again, how did it get to this? Environmental value systems. 20 years ago, the Dutch made a national commitment to sustainable agriculture under the motto, twice as much food using half as many resources. Since 2000, the Dutch have reduced dependence on water for key crops by as much as 90%. They've almost completely eliminated the use of chemical pesticides on plants in greenhouses, and since 2009, Dutch poultry and livestock producers have cut their use of antibiotics by as much as 60%. Finally, let's consider electricity consumption per household. 24.23 billion kilowatts in the Netherlands compared to 1.36 trillion kilowatts in the United States. That's 56 times more electricity consumption per household than the Netherlands. This difference in household consumption also illustrates that ecological footprints can vary from person to person. Again, all of these choices contribute to the Netherlands' lower ecological footprint as compared to the United States. Degradation of the environment together with the utilization of finite resources is expected to limit human population growth. By now, in this course, you are familiar with the impacts of farming, deforestation, eutrophication, loss of fresh water, loss of biodiversity, and global warming all anthropogenic resu results from our presence on Earth. Needless to say, if human populations do not live sustainably, they will exceed the carrying capacity and risk collapse. On that cheery note, this ends subtopic 8-point fewer, human systems and resource use. Here is a summary of all that was covered in this movie. This ends the movie for IBESS Topic 8.4, Human Systems and Resource Use. The slides were created by me, Dr. Nina Markham. Image citation is placed under the image. If all images on a slide are from the same source, the source is simply cited at the bottom of the slide. Another resource for you is your IBESS textbook, whether in hardback form or online, such as Cognity. Thank you for listening.